Hi, I'm Chris Wolf. I'm co-director of the Thomas International Center. And one of the great opportunities I have as co-director of the center is to interview really interesting people that we bring into the Triangle in North Carolina to speak for us. And today we're fortunate to have William Saunders, Jr., who is vice president of Americans United for Life, a human rights lawyer in Washington, D.C. And welcome, Bill. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Chris. Really, really happy to be here. Great. So let's talk uh, a little bit about your background, uh, where you come from and uh, your, your cursus in aurum, uh, you know, the, what, the route you traveled to get to where you are today. Well, you know, uh, I come from here. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina, uh, not from Raleigh, but from Greensboro, which is about an hour away. Uh, I, I am uh, one of these people in North Carolina, born and bred. I love, I love North Carolina. And so I'm very happy that the Thomas International Center is here and engaged in this kind of outreach to the community because I'm also an adult convert to Catholicism. I grew up as a Methodist and I became a Catholic uh, about 17 years ago. Um, so I grew up in Greensboro. I was a Moorhead Scholar at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and after that I went away to Harvard Law School and unfortunately never got back to North Carolina. <laughs> And where'd you go from Harvard? Well, I, I, the reason I went to Harvard Law School was I did think I was coming back to North Carolina and I wanted to go <clears throat> live somewhere else for a while. But after law school, I got a job opportunity with a, a great law firm in Washington called Covington and Burling. They were the oldest, uh, I believe they were the oldest law firm in Washington. They were the largest at the time. Dean Acheson, who's Secretary of State, had been, had been there. Uh, they were really uh, well-known, good law firm, really good lawyers. So I worked there for a few years. Uh, one thing I learned from them that I really appreciated was when they made an argument, because you're always either going before an administrative agency or a court, and you've got a, you're trying you're on behalf of a client, so you're trying to win an argument, win a case. What Covington was superb at was focusing on the main point at issue. So there would be all these subsidiary points that would get you to the main point. And some lawyers with bad, in a bad decisions would argue every little point. Covington would, con uh, would concede the unimportant things or the things that clearly were contrary even to what they wanted, but they would get to the main point, they would engage the main point and they'd really hit it hard. So I think they, that was good training. Interesting. So how did you get from uh, the private legal world into the public world where you spent so much of your life? Uh, that's a long uh, story, which I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't go all of it, over all of it, but um, probably the essential thing for, for me was around the time my life, this was probably a few years, uh, 10 years, or eight years out of law school, something like that, I started searching religiously. I mean, I started kind of taking Christianity more seriously and also looking into all kinds of other religions. Just to, I was just really, for some reason, had a God hunger. And that eventually led me into the Catholic Church. So around that same time, as my religious faith was getting deeper, I started to appreciate the importance of religious freedom for everybody. And so I started to work with a human rights organization in Washington. And it was a lawyer's group, and it predominantly worked for, uh, on behalf of the rule of law, which means fair treatment of everybody. Everybody treated the same equality before the law. And uh, so it, particularly if, if somebody was harassing judges like or the Bar Association, I remember in Egypt at the time, there were efforts to destroy the Bar Association to put their leaders in jail, we would help them. But as part of my work there, because, and we can talk more about this, but uh, most people who do human rights are secular human rights people. They, they don't have religious faith, and although religious freedom is listed in all the human rights documents, they, it's kind of off their radar screen. They're, they're, they're aware of freedom of press, uh, freedom from torture, freedom of speech, but the religious freedom, so I was the only one in the office who was really very interested in that. So whenever religious people came over with some problem, I would be kind of assigned to deal with them. And through that, I, I met a, uh, 
a Catholic bishop uh, from the Sudan who, who wanted help because his people were undergoing genocide. And listeners may find this surprising, but I, we're talking literal genocide being herded into areas and shot or starved to death or uh, and it was done by the the uh, government of the Sudan was run by Islamic fundamentalists that had taken the p power in a coup and they thought the whole country should be Islamized so everybody should be forced to convert to Islam and to fundamentalist Islam and if you didn't do it they're perfectly willing to let you starve to death or shoot you or whatever there also was a lot of slavery uh, which again, listeners may be, you know, isn't slavery something that happened 150 years ago or something? In, in Sudan, in Africa, it was happening a few years ago. There was a flourishing slave trade, and they would send, they would arm these militias or tribal groups who would go down into uh, the black part of the country. I just need to step back and say Sudan is kind of, it's bigger, it's, uh, I think it's, um, five times the size of Texas. So it's a big place. It's got different ethnic groups uh, and the north is more uh, Islamic uh, or Arab culture and Islamic faith. The south was more what black African and traditional and there was some Christian in that. But um, so they would send slave traders to the south to take uh, slaves. and. You know, we, we did some, so I started to work with this bishop. We set up an organization. We traveled in there. You know, there were times when they shot at us and from, and we had to have bodyguards. I mean, it was, it's like being in a, in, a, in a, kind of in a war zone, although with a, a lot of distance, but it's like a war zone if Texas was a war zone. I mean, it's, a, it's not like they're right next door to you. But still, you had to have bodyguards. They shot at our, we would come in in an airplane uh, illegally from Kenya and they would fire at it and stuff. But I remember this very clearly because we also met with some of these people who had been slaves. And when I say people, I mean women and children because the men were all killed. When they come into a village, they kill all the men. They killed all the men. They would take the women and children. Uh, they would treat the women. They would just rape them over and over and take them and just treat them as to, to break their will and they would make them into house servants. The little little children were usually tending cattle or goats, and they would do things like cut their Achilles tendons so they couldn't run away. But even so, we we met some few who had gotten away, and there were beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stories. There was uh, one woman who who dreamed one night that um, uh, uh, somebody uh, came to her in a dream and said, "Your name shall be." Therese, and she didn't know who that was, and she was able to escape, and so she's now Therese. And uh, there were uh, there were little kids who'd gotten away, and they told us, you know, how they had been treated. Uh, one slave, this slave taking was not had a long and dirty history in this part of the world. It goes back to the under under the Ottoman Turks, and there was a woman taken as a slave back in the 1800s who was. Uh, eventually ended up in Italy and she was the kind of uh, in, a, in a nunnery and she eventually became the first canonized saint from that part of the world. Josephine Bakita? Josephine Bakita. Interesting. And uh, in fact I was in Rome for that canonization. Yes. And um, she was a great inspiration to the Christians and Catholics in Eastern Africa because mm -hmm. Sudan is 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 kind of just below if you're looking at a map just below Egypt so it's <clears throat> the eastern side so anyway we did quite a lot of work so for a while I kinda had two jobs I was doing all that Sudan work and I was doing this other human rights work but it was it was a perfect uh, kind of meshing of the relig my own religious experience with the, the needs of people who were being killed okay. And where's the, then you went to another organization? Yeah, um, I, um, my, my godfather is a Catholic, as somebody a lot of people know is Robert George, and uh, we went to law school together, and he became a commissioner at the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. So I worked with him there for a couple of years, and we worked again 
a lot on religious liberty there in the public schools and uh, because that's guaranteed a lot of people may not know it but under our constitution you have religious freedom you don't give it up when you go to a public school and uh, so and then after that I went to work for an organization that worked on social issues in the US uh, called the Family Research Council and uh, what, were some, what were some of the issues you worked on there well, you know, when I first started working there, which was around uh, 2000, I, I was doing some work on religious freedom still because FRC was one of the few groups that was paying attention to what was going on in the Sudan. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a very courageous thing for them to do institutionally because so few people knew about it, but they, were, they did, they understood there was this horrible persecution. And, and in the Sudan, they, you know, it was very anti-Christian, anti-Catholic. Um, in f but, in fact, it drove a lot of conversions. But anyway, the, the main issue, or one of the main issues I worked on, was cloning and stem cell research. Mm. There, was, there was a whole lot of that. That, that issue was very big around then. Yeah, so what were some of the things that you would do with respect to that issue? Well, there was efforts in Congress to pass laws to permit the cloning of uh, human beings, or destroy human beings for embryonic, uh, to take their embryonic stem cells to use in research. Um, there was a question of would the federal government fund it? Uh, would there be, re what kind of regulations would there be to, to limit that? And it, it was a very um, intense time on that issue. It was pretty disappointing in a way because the level of discourse was very low. Uh, for instance, one of those, those who favored embryonic stem cell research said, said during a hearing, he, he took out a pencil and he said, are you telling me we're supposed to care about something that's smaller than the head of this pencil? Well, if it's a human being, yes, I'm telling you that. I mean, uh, you know, you don't not care about a human being who's this size toddler. And you don't have to get to be six feet tall for us to care. So your size is unimportant. It's whether you are a human being. Uh, so a lot of the discourse was that, that kind of level of just not engaging. The f there are two questions with any, any of these scientific, uh, so-called scientific issues uh, of this kind of research. One is what, what ent kind of entity you're dealing with and, and how ought you to treat that entity. And so, in other words, it's a human being, and we know how we should treat human beings. Those are the two answers. But uh, uh, there was a lot of dodging on the first question where they would say, well, maybe it's not a human being, you know, or it's so little it's not really a human being, or it becomes a human being after birth. Uh, there was a lot of that kind of talk, which was very disappointing because you can't possibly make public policy unless you admit the obvious, which is it is a human being. We know that from embryology. And then the question is, how do you treat it? Now, you might say, well, I want to cure all these uh, people who have uh, different diseases or injuries, which we, we do want to cure them. But I want to cure, the, you know, you might say, I want to cure them by doing this research that destroys this human being. So is that ethical? Is that, is, do we want a society in which we destroy one human being to, to benefit another human being? That's, that was the profound question that we didn't grapple with enough because we had a lot of this disinformation about what the entity was. It's so striking that, as it turned out, uh, down the road, uh, it became unnecessary, even from their perspective, yeah. to uh, destroy embryos because the possibility of reprogramming cells uh, made that, in, in a sense, outdated, even from a kind of technical, scientific uh, perspective. Yeah. it's. It's, uh, when I was a kid, my mother said, the end, the end does not justify the means. Mm -hmm. And that, that simple truth that everybody should know, I mean, it, you just don't, because if you start sacrificing one human being to save another human being, that principle cannot be contained. There's n nobody safe with that principle. I mean, you know, the people who think that's okay, the, that's because it's other people who are going to be subject to it. They wouldn't say, I, I, I'm certain the wealthy, uh, you know, people are not going to say you can kill wealthy people to help poor people. It's going to be the other way around. And it's going to be defenseless 
you know, the, the embryo or the fetus, you know, defenseless, tiny, helpless. And what kind of society is that? You know? yeah. So what other issues did you work on at FRC uh, besides the uh, cloning and stem cell? I also worked, uh, as I said, some on this international religious freedom. We were involved in some of that. And also in, we were involved for religious freedom in China. We did a fair amount mm -hmm. of work there. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's, it's kind of interesting because what Washington is about is about coalitions. Because nobody, no kind of point of view has enough power to pass laws by itself. So you work in coalitions. So with China, we worked with, uh, at FRC, which is a social conservative group, worked a lot with uh, liberal groups. And, um, uh, you know, Hollywood liberals, I mean, Richard Gere, and all these people who wouldn't agree with us on social issues, and we wouldn't agree with them, but they would agree on the need for religious freedom in China. So did a lot of work on that. <clears throat> I also did a fair amount of work on, on, on marriage as well. Um, did a lot of writing and a lot of talks on that. Um, and one, one element that unites the, the marriage issue with the life issue uh, is the role of the courts. And I, at that time, this, is, this was in the you know, mid-2000s or the courts hadn't really taken over that issue like they seem to be trying to do now. Um, in a democracy, well, you can have any kind of democracy you want, but we've got a democracy of three co-equal branches, and it does not say government by the judiciary. So when the Supreme Court took abortion, that was an unconstitutional taking of an issue. That should have been left to the people. The Constitution doesn't speak on it. Same thing on marriage. I mean, if it doesn't say anything about it, the court shouldn't be making rulings. But in the time I was at FRC, the, the, I believe it was the Iowa Supreme Court came out and said there was a right to same-sex marriage. And so we were trying to get people to understand that this is a big issue of public importance, uh, profound implications for society, and given to the people to decide in a democracy how to deal with, not for just a few judges to decide. So I worked on that issue too. Mm -hmm. So then from FRC, you ultimately move on to Americans United for Life? Yep. Uh, uh, yep. Tell us a little bit about some of the work you've been doing at AUL. Uh, AUL is the, uh, well, the oldest or one of the oldest national pro-life groups. We go back to 71. So listeners will know that Roe v. Wade, where the Supreme Court created the right to abortion, was 1973. So actually, we were pre-Roe v. Wade, and, and it's a lawyer's organization. So we've been involved in all Supreme Court cases uh, that have had to do with life, um, and in many lower courts as well. But So what do lawyers do? Um, well, you are sometimes in court, you know. It's, 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 not, it's not like Perry Mason or... Matlock or whoever is the TV guy now. We're not in there kind of doing that kind of work, but sometimes we're, we're in there def defending a state law. What AUL has, has kind of achieved its uh, greatest renown on is designing state laws so that state legislature, late legislators, say in North Carolina, can decide, well, we want to pass a law that, that uh, puts, that makes, a, a, say, abortion clinics adhere to the same standards that any medical clinic would have to, or that says before a, a girl has an abortion who's underage, her parents have to know about it, or to tell the woman herself about all the physical and psychological risks that come with abortion. Uh, so we design model laws, we publish a compendium of these every year called Defending Life, and we work with state legislators to pass those laws. We will help defend them in court, uh, all the way to the Supreme Court. We believe that eventually uh, the Supreme Court will see that it made a mistake in Roe v. Wade and it will reverse Roe v. Wade, in which, at which point the issue goes to the states. It will be the state of North Carolina to decide what kind of abortion laws do you want to have. And our model laws would be helpful then, too. 
What are some of the con contemporary current issues that you're confronting right now? Well, I think that uh, a couple of that I just mentioned, this, this clinic regulation uh, issue, because, of course, Kermit Gosnell in Philadelphia, the abortionist who, uh, it's, it's almost too sickening to uh, recount, but he would, you know, he had filthy conditions dead baby parts all over the, the abortion uh, facility. Uh, a woman died there because he just, the, uh, ab abortionists treat women like pieces of meat and they just cut on them. And if they're bleeding, a lot of, you know, sometimes they let them die. And there was another case, this Tanya Reeves in Chicago who died because they didn't get her emergency room after a botched abortion. So at AUL, our view, and I think it's the view of uh, everybody in the pro-life movement is, you know, there are many victims in abortion. There's obviously the innocent unborn child. There's also the woman who a lot of times is, is a, a lot of times is pushed into it by men in her life who are, could be a father, could be a boyfriend, you know, or uh, somebody she's uh, in a relationship with she's not married to, pressured into it or she, whatever else. So there's, we, we don't, it's important that abortion clinics, since right now they're constitutionally permitted, which one day we hope there won't be any such clinics, but if they're going to exist, that they don't treat women like worse than a, an animal in a animal surgery. So that's an issue. Another one is what's called a 20-week abortion ban or limit. Uh, that is the... the, the the, a lot of the research shows that when you hit about 16, 17 weeks, the risk to women from abortion goes exponentially high. The risk of death is 76 times what it was in the first eight weeks when you get into the, uh, to the later uh, time in pregnancy. The fetal pain has been shown to, to be there maybe as early as 16 weeks certainly about 20 weeks. So these kind of statutes say, look, the state has an interest in the health of the woman, the state has an interest in the, what the Supreme Court calls potential life. We know it's a human being, but they call it potential life. And because of those things, the state has the power to prohibit abortions after a certain period of time. Now the Supreme Court, that's a, that's a very cutting edge issue because the Supreme Court has never said you can prohibit an abortion, but our argument is that in fact if you take certain principles in their decisions, this should be constitutional. Um, so those are some of the issues. Okay. You've also done some work on religious liberty and the HHS mandate, haven't you? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in fact... Uh, Why don't you explain a little bit about the background for the occasional listener who might not have heard about this. Uh, there's something... Well, everybody's heard of Obamacare and uh, or the Affordable Care Act. Our organization, actually, we also work at the national level in D.C., so we were very involved in, in, re, in, re, in resisting the anti-life aspects of that law. We take no position on whether there should be that kind of medical uh, structures or whether there should be socialized medicine or, you know, what we, we don't take... But, we oppose things that are anti-life. So there were some aspects of that Obama, what I'll call Obamacare, that were anti-life, potentially anti-life. One of them <clears throat> was a provision that was put in saying that uh, every medical plan has to have, cover certain preventive services for women. But that wasn't defined. So then the Department of Health and Human Services, which is one of the departments under President Obama in the executive branch, it defined preventive services for women to include contraceptives, sterilizations, and some abortifacients. Now, abortifacient could be a drug or a device that interrupts a pregnancy once it's started. So we, although our organization is not involved in... Uh, the contraceptive issue, we are involved in the abortifacient issue because that's taking a life after it's been, you know, created. And <clears throat> from the beginning when Obama, uh, HHS came up with these regulations, of course many of the religious groups and particularly the Catholic 
church and the Catholic bishops, you know, said, this violates our religious beliefs. We're citizens in the United States of America. There's a First Amendment that protects our religious beliefs. We're not, we are not going to provide these contraceptives. And there's been a, probably anybody listening has known that there's been a huge, it went over a year of political turmoil about how would this be dealt with. And eventually, last summer, the Obama administration came out with regulations saying that if you're a religious hospital or a religious school, uh, like we say Belmont Abbey here in North Carolina, um, you, don't, you don't have to comply with this requirement to provide contraceptives and abortifacients if you say you're not going to and you provide a certificate saying you're not going to to your insurer who will then, by the way, provide those things. So a lot of uh, Catholic and other uh, moralist uh, philosophers would say that's, that's made, you're complicit in that. And so there's still a lot of resistance to it. And uh, people may have heard of the cases having to do with Little Sisters of the Poor. They're saying, we're not going to provide that certificate because that enables it. So AUL has been involved in, and there's been, so there's a lot of litigation about this. Belmont Abbey has been in court, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor in court. But also ordinary Catholic and non-Catholic, uh, anybody who has a religious objection to doing this says, okay, I'm not a Catholic school, I'm not a Catholic institution, I'm a Catholic businessman. And I do not want to provide this. It violates my religious beliefs. And so there's a lot of litigation on those cases. In fact, uh, two of those have been accepted by the Supreme Court for review and will be, oral argument will be in about a month and a, about a month, a little over a month. And the issue, this is, for me, I'm a lawyer, so it may be boring for non-lawyers. For me, it's very fascinating because there's a statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Mm -hmm. And that statute basically guarantees your freedom of religion. And in order for the government to, to in, in, first of all, it has to be, there can be incidental things that happen. But if they substantially infringe your religion, uh, your religious beliefs, then they have to have a compelling reason, which is a very high standard and least restrictive means. It's high standard. It's the most difficult thing for the government to satisfy. So soon the Supreme Court, or hopefully by the end of this term, will, which means end of June, will decide whether or not businesses who object on religious reasons have to provide these things. But it still hasn't gotten to these, these other cases. So there's kind of two sets of cases. But anyway, AUL's been very involved because we've, we've made a lot of arguments about the abortifacient aspect of some of these so-called contraceptives. Mm -hmm. There's one called ELLA, which interrupts an established pregnancy. There can be uh, interuterine devices or Plan B. So they can, they can destroy an embryo. And so we filed a lot of briefs in these cases. Yeah, I mean, uh, kind of doing the kind of inside Supreme Court stuff, uh, it, it seems to me that there's actually a reasonably good chance we're going to win this one. Uh, I'm actually interested in the possibility that we may even be able to get some of the, what are typically regarded as the liberal votes on the Supreme Court because it seems to me so clear that this does inv in invade religious liberty. Yeah, I think so too. It's... Um it does invade religious liberty, and that accommodation, I mean, it's like sometimes people need to, it's not only, you know, not only not doing an abortion, it's not referring somebody to do the abortion. And this is a very parallel kind of thing. It's like I'm not going to provide the contraceptives because it violates my conscience, and I'm not going to refer, essentially, by giving a form to the insurance company so they cover it as a... The president says for free and outside the plan, but it's really connected to it. So I think it is a central element of religious freedom. Um, there are some kind of technical legal questions, you know, about whether a small company has religious freedom or it's only its owners or whatever. So the court could possibly hide behind some technicalities, but this is such a big, real political issue that has consequences in the public that I can't imagine they, they would think they can just duck away from it. Well, stepping back for a moment at the uh, end of our interview, you know, you've had a, a life as a human rights lawyer, and uh, when people think of human rights lawyers, as you suggested earlier, they, they don't typically think of somebody like you. Mm -hmm. uh, they think of maybe some kind of uh, a, a European lawyer who wants to spread the right to abortion around the globe. Uh, 
So uh, how would you kind of ca characterize uh, you know, being a human rights lawyer with your perspective? Well, I, I, I think that that is, uh, you have to understand what human rights are. And there's, there, there are different ways. But as a lawyer, I look to legal documents. But I think as a Catholic, for instance, the Catholic Church teaches a lot of things of, that have to do with truths about human beings and about human relationships. So the idea that a right could be counter to truth is, is incoherent, so philosophically. But from the legal documents, um, a lot of these documents came out of the Second World War. They protect things like life. They, they say every human being has the right to life. Now, I don't know how that can be twisted into saying that's right to abortion, although some people try to pretend it does. Uh, they, the documents also say that every man and woman has a right to marry and found a family. You, know, you can try to twist that into same-sex marriage if you want to, but it's clearly not what was intended. Uh, and it also protects religious freedom in a, in a number of ways. And it's not just religious freedom to worship, which is unfortunately some of the government now. Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, has talked about freedom to worship. Well, freedom to worship is important, but boy, that's not all there is in religious freedom. It's freedom to walk outside that church door and take your religious beliefs into the marketplace of ideas with, with your fellow citizens to shape the common good. So to me, there's a... There's a, it's a very important contest in the public for what are human rights and what do they mean. Because people who have bad ideas, in my opinion, who have bad ideas, are asserting all kinds of things are human rights. Now, <clears throat> kind of like I said before on the stem cell issue, there's really two questions. What rights are protected under law? And I say look to the human rights documents, and they don't protect any of these things that are being asserted these bad things like abortion. And then if they're not there, convince your fellow citizens that they should be there. If, if abortion is so essential to human flourishing and the common good, convince your fellow citizens to change the law to protect it. To me, that's the honest approach. And I hope they would be defeated, you know, in that trying to make that argument. But to pretend like human rights, human rights and this is where it ties back into stem cell research. Human rights for human beings. What does it mean, human rights? It means a human being. What is a human being? Embryology tells us from the first single cell zygote where the sperm and egg come together. I mean, it's, it's simple. It's science. That's a human being. If you don't want to protect that human being or treat it in the same way you treat other human beings, tell me why. What's the principle? And do we want to live with that principle? It's back to Lincoln. Yeah. Once you start... Uh, creating a, an argument for why you should treat somebody different because of color, why is it going to stop there? There's so many other ways you can distinguish among human beings saying, well, we'll protect some and not protect others. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Bill, for talking with us today. Again, I'm Christopher Wolf, co-director of the Thomas International Center, and we've had this great opportunity to talk to human rights lawyer William Saunders, Jr., who's had such a fascinating career in a very important area. And this is one of many interviews we have. There are others on our YouTube uh, channel. And we welcome you to, to take a look at many of those. And we hope to see you on some other occasion. Take care.